All right, so I'm talking about the balance of power, hip and ankle power trade-offs, which poor Amy is going to talk about in a few hours, too. I'm hoping I don't scoop too much of that. Uh, I'm digging way back to one of the classic results in, uh, in simpling, simple modeling. So this is from Art Quo's paper in 2002. You have a, a compass type inverted pendulum walker with a possibility of powering by input of a torque at, to the stance leg or push off power. And it comes up with this graph, which is a trade-off in so the, the output is the total mechanical work it takes to walk. And there's a trade-off between the hip power and the ankle power, such that the lowest work case is pure push off. I, and I'm, I'm loosely calling this ankle because we like to think of it in human terms, right? It's just a leg push off. Uh, and the highest cost is with hip only, and it's got a factor of four between them. And so the question is, do things really follow what this appears to predict, which is that an optimized walker should use only push-off power, like maybe only ankle power? So my problem that started bothering me was that a human doesn't do this. We do something else. This is uh, a result from Greg Sawicki about 10 years ago, uh, where if you actually measure what humans do at the joints, there's the biggest single contribution is actually from the hip. Ostensibly the worst thing you could do if you're going to act in any way like this, I don't know, won't say in any way. In, act in accordance with the full prediction of that simplified model, okay? So shouldn't this be zero? And then, okay, so it's not zero. Assume people do something do, something else. If we can make that number smaller, uh, shouldn't that save energy? And the reason, of course, that it's not zero is that there's a torso up top, right? So you have to manage this in order to keep it upright. And that has some consequences. So what can you do? Well, farther back, uh, McGear had a couple of uh, findings about what you might use a torso for. So if you lean it forward, you get a torque on your torso, which is pulling your trunk up. Uh, and that will cause positive hip work as you push your leg through its excursion, pulling it to the back. OK. And so that allows you, that's, that's work in, which means you should be able to reduce your push off. It should result in a greater collision, because the push off is what keeps the collision low. And there's a possibility of a torso impact uh, cushioning kind of effect by making the change in velocity that the pelvis goes through not aligned with the axis of the torso anymore, right? So you can get kind of a lever over that that makes the, the collision lower, maybe. Or you can lean back, uh, and that gives you negative hip work, a braking kind of effect, which you should have to overcome with more push off, which should reduce your collision more and possibly lead to greater torso impact. And so the question really was, does this trade-off work in real people and robots? So we did a, a rather horrible experiment to people <laughs> where we, we put an IMU on their chest and gave, wirelessly transmitted that out and gave them a screen with the feedback of their torso angle relative to what it was when they were walking normally. Okay? So zero here is not some absolute zero. It's whatever they did when they came in. But then we had them lean back to 15 degrees and walk, and all the way in 15 degree increments to 60 degrees forward. And we measured metabolic rate, so they had to do this for five and a half minutes. Uh, we <laughs> you should try it outside. Actually, you kind of did it on the way up the mountains, which maybe Amy will, will talk about. Um, we took motion capture, inverse dynamics, center of mass mechanics, and so on. So the good news is, when you do the motion capture, you can see that people are able to largely follow this result. Uh, for five minutes at a time. And here's a, a ton of graphs of which I'm not going to make you unpack all. But I want to talk you through a few critical things. So first off, over on the right, what is the hip doing? The upper graph shows that the hip angle was changing. That's just a simple reflection that they followed the instructions. The, the second one shows that the hip moment was changing, which is the basic effect of leaning a mass forward about a pivot point. Okay, And then in the bottom, it shows that we got hip power out of that. So these are just the very basics of holding something upright. So that worked nicely. It had a consequence that I didn't anticipate, which is that people bent their knees. Uh, you may have noticed that in some of those really forward leaned postures in the motion capture or the photos, right? They're, they were walking with bent knees, which might be a consequence of uh, sort of a length limitation on hamstrings for most people. Um, and then. There was an, another interesting effect here, which is that the ankle moment increased in magnitude earlier in the gait cycle. So 
as you lean forward, your center of mass from the upper half is kind of forward. I think that means you're on balance out towards your forefoot a little more uh, in terms of where your center of mass is located, okay? And this was just weird, so I'll talk about that later. Uh, and then finally, this I also didn't expect, which is that the knees absorb a bunch of power, uh, which we actually have seen in a lot of other cases with, uh, for example, prostheses that don't do quite what you expect. The knee often is resolving things for you. So that's one of the things that seems to be happening. But this is what happened with the center of mass work rate. So if you look at the, at the legend up there, you go from dark blue, uh, red, yellow, purple, green, and light blue, which is that way. So this is what I've called single stance work. That's things that don't happen at the step-to-step -step transition. And it's becoming more positive, right? More work coming out at that time, which we would largely attribute to the action of the hip. So that makes sense. And then the push-off comes down. So that's, the, that's predicted by the models as well. This is the ankle, which we didn't control, responding in some way to the presence of work input elsewhere to the body. The collision got bigger in the negative direction like that. So that is as predicted, right? We lowered the push-off, which would have prevented that. And so now it's big. So all of the center of mass mechanics make sense. I had been hoping that it would work to do that at the ankle, right? That we would say push off is going down, we can cause ankle, uh, ankle work to come down. And that only sort of, sort of works. So if you look at this graph, the highest one up there is back 15, which should have led to higher push off. And then the red, yellow, and purple look like they're going downward in the right direction. But what happens when you get to leaning 45 degrees forward and worse? The ankle is pushing off more. It reversed. So on balance, this doesn't look like a whole lot of change across that whole range, which was kind of weird to me. So it does this kind of reversing behavior. And that I can't explain. So still working on it. The data are only 10 hours old. So We did measure metabolic rate. And we found that the optimum is where you might expect at zero, which is not a strictly upright center of mass above the hip joint kind of zero. It's whatever they did when they walked in, right? So good. People are doing on their own what appears to be best for them. Uh, but when I tried to explain this, that's the meta metabolic rate graph over here. And this is the total center of mass work rate, which is essentially flat across all the conditions. And that, that boggles my mind, because I was expecting a factor of four in any trade-off between push-off and hip work or single stance work, right? And it didn't come out when you measure the whole center of mass uh, work rate. Right. So that's a mystery that we'll be digging into further. Uh, but when I complained to Greg Sawicki about this, he said, try this new formula I came up with over there on the right, which just has to do with moments. So this is a cost of changing, modulating moments about the joints. And look at that beautiful prediction. It has the same form. It has almost the same minimum. Cool, right? So those are some fun findings. Uh, so what's left to, to study about this? This, OK, what's, it, what's in that? That is the mean absolute rate of change of moments, which in, in Greg's parlance would be cost of changing muscle activation. Did I get that right, Greg? Good, almost right. So we're going to throw these data points on top of his anvil and see how big it grows in the end. Uh, the fit looks great, right? OK, so, so there's some things to, to investigate further here. I don't know yet how to, uh, how to address the question of collision cushioning on the torso, right? There is this big effect. Something should happen. I don't know how to measure it. Uh, the large angles leading to crouch gait, meaning bent knees, um, is, was not expected, but probably is hamstrings. Don't know why the ankle power is re-increasing. Uh, and then there's some applications like, as you age, you start using less push-off from your ankles. Can we train people by leaning back to recover that? Because that's the one condition that made the ankle push-off go up a little bit. OK, so that's a little crazy. Then I want to try it in a, in a badger robot. So this is a hip torque driven, upright torso, rimless wheel robot, plus push-off, which is in red because it's not done yet. And maybe there's a video. Oops. Oh, 
my punchline. Okay. So this is Badger. This is Badger Robot, called Torso Bot by Tana, who built it. It's walking past some of its ancestors. That's Rando. That's Moonwalker. So these are the. These are the. This is actually the um, cheap before expensive approach that uh, is opposite of what our recent advice was. So we're starting to do some experiments uh, here about measuring the relationship between speed and torso angle. Why do I call it Badger Robot? That's not a typo. That's why. Max found and Sean O'Connor published this with him a few years ago that kangaroos use their tail to do push off in part. So Badger, Bucky Badger, the world's best mascot, and a kangaroo-like tail. So this is this is a set of servos that acts in parallel with the main wheel back here to give a push off that's separate from the leg itself. Okay. So by the time we get that going, we'll be able to modulate push off at the back and torso lean at the, at the top and do some calorie counting. And then I also thought maybe I should do that at some point to try and optimize the, uh, the expense here and badger ruage and bot or something like that. Okay, so there's some questions that I'll, I'll um, ask about that going forward. But the summary here today is you can change walking power with trunk lean so that hip torque and push off trade bumping. Total work doesn't change, nor the ankle. How strange. Badger Robot will help probe the meaning. Uh, questions? Carl Zellick showed that uh, if you use a spring at the ankle, that you could actually use the hip to power push off. Do you think that would help explain your weird ankle findings? So a spring at the ankle is something we already have built in, right? So if you uh, want to do an isometric loading of the muscle and use the tendon itself to harvest energy that's put in somewhere else, it's entirely possible that you could do this, this sort of temporal and geographical relocation of, of work like that so that uh, something um, more comes out. But I would expect it to show up somewhere in the inverse dynamics. So you have to dig in and, and Follow that causal chain a little bit. Yeah, uh, Alex from Max Where is your center of mass in your bench robot? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's somewhere above the, above the hip, that's for sure. It's probably about halfway up. But okay. And in, maybe in front of the hip? It's probably in front. What's that? So how do you stabilize it? Uh, so that one of the interesting things on the previous slide is that the stability and mobility properties of this are. Um, inspired by balancing robots, segway style balancing robots, but they're actually completely different. Uh, all you have to do is hold it still, and the fact that it has two points means it's stable over a significant range of torso angle to begin with. So when the, the reason to study, uh, where's my other plot? That plot is that unlike a self balancing robot with wheels, uh, a steady state speed requires a positive torso lean to keep putting work in because there's a continual loss step over step, right? Whereas a, a, something with wheels will accelerate with a trunk lean and then stand back upright. So the stability properties are completely different and super easy to actually do. <laughs> so, but you, you don't show how this case initiated video, right? So right. how do you do that? Because statically that thing would fall forward, right? No. Uh, so well, it, it's, got a, it's got a motor holding at the joint, right? So it'll hold the torso in, well, I'll just say it's a high gear ratio uh, drive between the torso and the legs. So if you shut it off, it just sort of sits there. Can I, um, can I answer that question? The, le the legs lean back. When the body leans forward, the legs lean back. The center mass always stays over the feet, over the, oh, between the two feet. <coughs> yes, okay. Well, well, Thank you for simplifying. The important part is that you just hold it by torque. Yes, the torso is held up by torque at the hip joint. Already forward, like slightly to the between the two yeah. feet, slightly forward. Yeah. So, so like a self-balancing robot, we wrap a, a, a speed controller around the whole thing, which means if it's going too slowly, it will lean forward more. <coughs> which, when you tune that up correctly, will initiate the gate. We don't tune it correctly, so somebody has to come up and poke it just to get it started. But that's how it's modulating as it goes. Question. Hi, uh, Joe Payne, Carnegie Mellon. Uh, so you have this, so earlier you mentioned that you were looking for like a factor of four change in cost, uh, but then 
when you talk about the metabolic cost, how are you factoring in that walking <coughs> isn't the only thing these people are doing while they're doing that? I have no formal way of accounting for that. Okay. Right, so like I said, data are 10 hours old, so it's, I've only begun exploring what, the, what it all means at this point. Cool. But the fact that there's no changes is mind boggling to me in the, in the, the workout. There are probably five people in this room who've done an optimization calculation and predicted the locomotion of this model with various muscle costs. So have any of them done the tipping forward constraint and, and, and be able to say something like, or have you done the, I mean, it seems like rather than just use the center of mass collision models and so on, you can actually do a real calculation and see what the optimization says with at least some reasonable cost functions for the, for the joint work and metabolic cost. And uh, so, I mean, there must be five people here who have done this and can talk about it. Not uh, yes. I'm not one of them. What? Not with that constraint problem. Not with the lean and constraint. So there are five people here who within an hour could answer this question, right? Yes, absolutely. But it's not answered yet as far as I know. Um, well, I'll, I'll, so I have a related point to Andy's, I think, and that is what I don't necessarily would expect COM work rates to correlate very well with metabolic power because well, first of all, you miss part of the mechanical energy change that's rotation with respect to center of mass, right? And then another thing is that mechanical energy change, I mean, we have a system with tendons that might store energy and return energy, so yeah. instantaneous joint work or instantaneous COM power or these type of things don't necessarily reflect at all instantaneous <coughs> muscle uh, power. Yeah, and yeah. that muscle, instantaneous muscle power also does not reflect instantaneous metabolic rate in the muscle. So there are many complications between those two measures. So and that's to me, it's not uh, super surprising that they don't correlate well. And that's been a growing theme, I think, that we're detecting. So another, another poke at it here. But one of the things I want to mention is that when I, when I talked about torso impact um, cushioning like this, one of the things that I think might be beneficial about that is the muscle energy storage property or sort of a, a, a double benefit. Like the, if you are cushioning a collision so your torso does a bob instead of a bump, mm -hmm. then that is going to require extra loading on the hip muscles, which then is going to give you work back and might be sort of a net so benefit. You should mount the spring on the back of the people's back. Yeah, to help that's, them out with that. Yeah, yeah. that absorbs the energy of the... Uh, yeah. Sorry, one more question while we're getting set up. Okay. Uh, yeah. So you gave rate of moment, and what would you expect if you calculate rate of force in these type of moments? Do you have that? Yeah. If I can, so the question is, I, I calculated rate of changes in moment to be the cost function. What would I expect if I did rate of change of force? I assume you mean taking it to the point of muscle force? I would expect the same thing um, with, uh, with the caveat that there are things like the actual length and cross-sectional area of different muscles that would probably have to be accounted for in that. And, well, that wasn't happening between midnight and now, so it didn't happen yet. <laughs> All right, let's, let's thank Peter. Thank you, everybody.